Good afternoon. Um, so my title makes it sound as if I'm just going to go through the barriers and challenges we identified, but um, <coughs> there's more to the barriers and challenges than just what came out of the evidence review. One of the barriers and challenges is that nothing came out of the evidence review. But um, I'm going to take you through some of this. So this is going to be a whistle-stop tour of a very comprehensive evidence review that we undertook through the HRB, um, commissioned by the Department of Health. The background to it being that we know that about 70% of Irish patients express a desire to remain at home while they're receiving palliative care treatment, um, provided they can access the appropriate services and supports to help them with that. Um, we know that out-of-hours provision of palliative care that meets the needs of patients and their families is fundamental to delivering an integrated care approach, simply because three-quarters of the time people would be spending at home is out of hours. Out of hours is everything after 5 p.m. until 9 a.m. the next day, and during weekdays, and then the entire weekend. So 75% of the week is out of hours. Um, and we know that needs are common in that period with limited access to services that can meet those needs. And we have evidence in Ireland that poor patient outcomes have been directly linked to inadequate community supports and particularly a lack of patient confidence in the ability to access out-of-hour services. Um, and we also know, that it's been brought up in um, a few of the presentations today, that um, recent initiatives to identify research priorities, uh, both in Ireland and the United Kingdom, have found that out-of-hour service provision is the number one research priority. And it's against this background um, that the Department of Health commissioned a review of the evidence uh, both the best available scientific evidence, but best sorry, evidence of um, international best practice around the provision of um, out-of-hours palliative care. So both, although Charles has said we shouldn't talk about generalists and specialists, it is, we looked at both generalists and specialists. So we were looking at any type of provision of care for people out of hours living with palliative care needs, whether that was de delivered by generalist services or it was delivered by specialist services. Um, and there's three major pro or recent policy developments that inform the context of seeking this evidence review. We know there'll be a, a, an update of the National Palliative Care Policy in Ireland from 2020. Um, the Sláinte Care Reform Program, which has been mentioned previously, but this is the roadmap for transitioning in Ireland from a two-tier system to a public universal health care system where people are provided care on the basis of need rather than ability to pay. And one of the key recommendations was universal palliative care provision within the first five years of implementation of Sláinte Care. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I worked with a, a broad and talented team uh, with a multidisciplinary background. So it was myself, but Dr. Peter May, uh, Rachel McCauley, both in Trinity College, uh, Dr. Virginia McQuillan um, from Beaumont and St. Francis Hospice, Dr. Mary Rabbit from the Institute, uh, and two information specialists in Trinity, Katrina Honahan and David Mockler, and then led by uh, Professor Steve Thomas, who's at the Center for Health Policy and Management as well. So the review specified the questions that we should look at. And the four questions were, what is the effect of out of hours specialist and generalist palliative care services on patient and or family care outcomes or on costs and cost effectiveness? So we look at both patient or caregiver level, but we also would consider costs if there was evidence available. Uh, what are the models of out-of-hours palliative care services in high-income countries that have such programs? What are the indicators used to measure the effectiveness of these services in those countries we looked at? And what are the barriers to and facilitators of implementing out-of-hours services? So the evidence for the effects of out-of-hours was the first question, on either cost or on outcomes. This was addressed with a systematic review so the PICO being people over the age of 18 with palliative care needs, the intervention being palliative care supports out of hours. We had to have a comparative element within, so we were looking to compare. We were looking for studies that offered some sort of comparison and demonstrated the effects of the palliative care provision out of hours. Um, and, and we didn't limit with the outcomes. We would take either a patient or caregiver or economic outcomes. Uh, we searched nine databases. Um, and the gray literature with the support of the information specialists. We included snowball sampling, uh, the screening of titles and abstracts, um, and then assessment of the quality of the, the evidence. Um, the systematic database review brought back 1,500 citations. Actually, that was 666 
We, we reviewed 40 texts. One met eligibility criteria, and then, then it was excluded because it didn't meet the quality assessment test. So we actually found zero peer-reviewed studies evaluating the impact of palliative care for adults out of hours for patients or caregivers or economic outcomes in the international literature. So that's the first barrier. There's no evidence to help people plan services. And then the second part of the review was the two questions about describing the models of care um, and then identifying and appraising the indicators used to measure the effectiveness of out-of-hours care. So we looked at 16 countries in the end, and I won't go through them all here, but we looked at 16 countries, and the criteria for inclusion were people who were, or countries who were members of the OECD, so a high-income country, but also that they were um, listed as being a, a level 4B provider of palliative care in the global atlas, so highly integrated palliative care. So they had to have the crossover of the two. And that gave us 16 countries in the end, including Ireland. Now the department had specified the things that they wanted extracted in terms of the model of care and understanding, and that included things such as the target population, the description of services, the way that teams are formed, but also how they collaborate, the training given to palliative care providers, the competency expected of different members of the teams, um, how collaboration and information sharing is dealt with both within services, but between services, both in the community and in hospitals. So it was quite a broad number. In total, there were 11 data points that we were asked to, asked to extract upon looking at that. So we used policy and practice documents from countries, first of all, to identify that. We shared our um, extraction with leaders and experts in each country to verify that we had understood the material appropriately and to fill in the gaps where necessary. So very briefly on what we found in models of care, overall there was a general acknowledgement of the importance of patient-centered 24-hour access to community-based services, that it should be efficient and equitable, and they should be, that we found uh, examples of well-established frameworks for out-of-hours care, particularly from Australia and the United Kingdom. The definition of out-of-hours for most countries tended to be 5 to 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next day, although some countries such as France had an extended um, business hours type approach with 7 to 8 um, being the, the end of the working day. Um, and then the target population, again, almost every document we looked at relied on the WHO definition of people you know, experiencing life-limiting illness. Uh, there was stratification for need in some ca uh, cases, including Australia, um, and uh, an exceptionalism for cancer was uh, identified in Japan. So um, a policy document saying that people with cancer were much more in need of palliative care than others and should be prioritized for access. So again, while we found basic descriptions and, and uh, explicit commitment to the idea of providing palliative care, there was very little in terms of the information about what the model of care actually looks like, if it's standardized, um, how it's delivered, how information is shared. There was very little information for us to collate on that. Um, we did find some examples of innovation, though, that are worth bringing out. Um, for one example would be specialist paramedic training in the United Kingdom through Macmillan. That's a program to ensure that uh, ambulance staff are upskilled in providing care to people with palliative care needs. Um, if, for example, that's used for rapid transfer of the dying to their chosen place of death, um, appropriate transport for the patient and carer in some circumstances, and having information systems in place to ensure that there's appropriate transfer of information. And then telehealth in Japan was used as another example in palliative care populations specifically for supporting people, particularly in remote locations. So we did find a few examples of that, and they're um, outlined more in the report. In terms of performance indicators, which was another question that was there, that was question three, we were looking for evidence of the performance indicators used in these countries to measure and evaluate the delivery of palliative care out of hours. We found only one set of performance indicators explicitly described in the literature, and that was from a, a 2011 report from the UK Department of Health, which has since been archived, so it's not in current circulation. Um, they outline things such as advanced care planning, access and communication, access to drugs. Um, however, it's worth pointing out that these measures were recommendations. They were never embedded into clinical practice. 
they hadn't been measured in terms of, or assessed in terms of their validity or usefulness as far as we could tell from the report. Um, and there was no clear guidance on how these outcomes should actually be measured. So no recommendations about the tools or the structures that should be used to do this. And then finally, the barriers and to facilitators to implementing these services. So it was good to look at what other countries are doing, but at the same time, if we're going to not reinvent the wheel or we're going to think about how applicable it is within Ireland, we need to think about what the barriers and facilitators have been in other countries. They are quite similar to Ireland, but. Um, so uh, we, as it was mentioned in the last presentation, we organized these into three levels just for the ease of the reader and the purpose of the evidence review wasn't specifically to identify barriers and facilitators, but to report on what we found from the other literature. So this is by no means a comprehensive review of that. Um, so what we did was we looked at every document that came from the systematic review, but also the policy documents and looked for any reporting of barriers and facilitators to implementation or delivery of palliative care through those documents. And we extracted all the relevant material where we could. Um, so the barriers, obviously these are familiar to most people, two health warnings here. Um, the barriers are not always specific to out-of-hours palliative care. Some of them are, are just general barriers to delivering out-of-hours care to any population. Um, and then the other is that um, sometimes while we've categorized them in one place, they could be others. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. So with something, for example, the macro being um, reluctance to refer among clinicians, you could also see that as being a micro level barrier as well. So we identified a number of barriers across these, but what was interesting about it, when you look at the facilitators, they almost mirror the barriers just described in a different way. So we didn't find something unique to facilitators or barriers, it was the way that things were delivered could be done in such a way that it either became a barrier or it became a facilitator. So having adequate resources, for example, was described as a facilitator to delivering care, whilst having inadequate resources was described as a barrier. Okay, so the policy implications and my concluding thoughts based on the evidence review. So what we know from the evidence and from the policy documents is that the importance of integrated 24-hour care for people with serious and complex medical needs is widely acknowledged. There's no policy document that doesn't say that that's important to do. However, there is almost no detail or evidence on how to organize, provide, or evaluate out-of-hours care effectively. These are complex interventions, obviously, and so part of this might be that studies have been unable to isolate the effects of palliative care provision out-of-hours on its own and report on that or have not done so so far. But it is something we're thinking about that no study reported individually the effect of any model of out of hours care and what it did for either costs or patient or caregiver outcomes. This is an evidence gap. No surprises here, a researcher who's going to almost finish by saying we need more research. But we do need more research. This is a, a really critical evidence gap that needs to be addressed with some level of urgency. We could begin by using statutory data sources, not just here in Ireland, but internationally, and we could work together to, do, to design studies that could do that. Um, but we also need to design original research and not just rely on, on statutory data sets. But these, uh, again, palliative care is a holistic, complex intervention. We need to make sure that the studies we're designing are flexible and pragmatic and across settings. People access care across settings, different healthcare professionals. It's an entire team delivering that care, and we need to make sure that our studies capture that appropriately. Um, again, there's the need for creation of new out-of-hours services, obviously because there's gaps and a lack of provision. We also know the population's expanding, so we need greater capacity. But we need to look at ways to improve the integration of the pre-existing services and, and out-of-hour services, both of them. Um, and that's going to be essential, and particularly looking at the barriers and facilitators that have been identified and how interventions and policies focusing on those could look to use that evidence to improve the delivery and integration of care. So for Ireland more specifically now, we're typical amongst high-income countries with well-established services. We know that Ireland's a world leader in delivering palliative care. We know that there is a commitment to providing integrated palliative care, but like all countries, we have an underdeveloped evidence base. That is challenging because we're moving into a phase now where we want to 
to deliver essentially universal access to palliative care based on needs. And so because we don't have standardized frameworks or approaches right now to measuring population need or service delivery, we first need to begin with a population needs based assessment for both generalists and specialist services. It's not just enough now to look at the, poor, the population who are dying, but we need to look at the needs they have when they're living with complex illnesses and how best those could be addressed. Um, we need to look at the timing and phasing of services. So it's not enough to say that we have a universal entitlement. You have to make sure that you have an upskilled workforce that can meet that need or the entitlement means nothing. Um, and we also need to have a well-resourced and established evaluator framework, perhaps drawing on experience from the United Kingdom or Australia, for example, where we're evaluating and monitoring our own progress towards delivering palliative care, both in hours and out of hours. So future developments for Ireland could include piloting programs, utilizing the innovations that we uncovered from other countries or identified from other countries, um, piloting programs that address the gold standard elements that were identified in palliative care out of hours frameworks. Again, looking at when we embed new programs that we're act proactively looking to overcome the identified barriers to integrating palliative care and ensure because of the critical evidence gap right now, we have to ensure that any programs that are rolled out and implemented, that there is, that there is an active um, move towards measuring and evaluating those services in terms of efficacy, e equity, and efficiency. That's vital moving forward, that all these services begin to do that more effectively. Thank you.